right. Thank you for that introduction. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. So today I'll be talking about exports and embargoes, trading with the enemy in colonial America. Um, it's a bit of an overview as opposed to an in-depth look. So we might have some review of colonial history in here. Um, so let's dive in. The American colonies, which were under British control in the 18th century, uh, rose up in rebellion against the British Empire in 1775. Uh, this rebellion and eventual revolution was preceded by import taxes, trade embargoes, and boycotts. Uh, however, throughout much of the conflict and immediately after it ended in 1783, Trade between Britain and the United States still took place. Um, this trade remarkably also consisted of British made goods specifically for the American market, uh, touting American politics, motifs, and mottos on creamware, textiles, and more. But how can manufacturers in Britain conduct business with treasonous colonists and vice versa? Uh, several factors contributed to this vibrant trading between enemies. To better understand the social, political, and economic factors at play, uh, I will examine the pre-revolution economic history of British American trade, uh, and then look to the objects themselves to discuss how such items came to be produced and exported. Um, I will focus specifically on transfer print cre creamware and textiles made in Britain and exported to America between 1750 and 1800. And while economic factors play the largest role, uh, the social factors at play are nearly just as important in facilitating the production and trade of special made goods for the American colonies. So let's dive into some economic history for context. So this map, which is similar to the one in the exhibit downstairs. Um, so in the 18th century, the US colonies exported raw materials and imported manufactured goods as well as slaves. At this time, the US lacked industrialization and factories for large scale production, uh, which were at the advent in Northern England. So prior to the revolution, Britain made up more than 80% of America's imports. So 80% of the goods entering the US colonies were from Britain. Um, despite the lack of industry in the colonies, the per capita income between 1700 and 1774 in the US colonies was 50% higher than that in England. So this number, uh, this had a number of effects, uh, bringing a steady stream of European migrants to America, um, helping to grow the uh, size and importance of the American market. And despite American notions of self-sufficient colonists, the colonies were very much linked to the global market and trade, uh, even in rural areas. Evidence of this can be found in American newspapers, which printed political news and crop news uh, from places such as Turkey and Russia, because it might affect the prices of American exported wheat and corn. Um, however, it's also important to remember that the global links the colonies enjoyed uh, were due to their connection with Britain. They enjoyed the benefits of a global empire and the British East India Company while under British rule. So a little rundown of the economic restrictions um, and policies that took place. Um, so keeping all of this in mind, the colonies were under British regulated trade for decades before they had any major qualms with the system. Uh, the Navigation Acts of 1651 and 1660 uh, forced all trade to be channeled through Britain, uh, which restricted imports and exports and the destination of goods. Uh, while stifling the development of certain industries in the colonies. Uh, this was not an unusual practice. Uh, the Dutch had similar policies with their colonies um, and to some extent Spain. So the routing of foreign goods, mostly Asian made goods through Britain before arriving in the colonies caused higher prices and taxes on those goods. So British made goods were much cheaper under the Navigation Acts for Americans to buy. So this practice inflated the importance of the American market for British manufacturers um, as the colonies became an important and large scale consumer. Overall, the navigation acts were not an awful burden to the colonies um, and were reasonably offset with the benefits of military protection. Uh, but all of this changed after the Seven Years War or the French and Indian War from 1756 to 1763. 
Uh, and during the war, Britain spent a large, large sums to protect the U.S. colonies. Um, after, it would, after which it sought repayment from the colonies for their services. Uh, this was the first time in which England was seeking to extract revenue from the colonies. Uh, and in Britain, the taxes were seen as a reasonable measure because Americans were wealthier um, and they were undertaxed. So the British government implemented a series of acts regarding taxes in the colonies, including the Sugar Act in 1764, the Stamp Act in 1765, the Townshend duties, and more. After the Sugar and Stamp Act, the colonists began a non-importation movement to boycott British goods. So before I get into the numbers, I just wanna take a moment to emphasize how important this moment was because American consumers realized how much power they had. Um, remember, there's lots of British goods, lots of manufactured products coming into the US um, and it's able to reach rural areas. So manufactured goods were part of everyday life for most Americans, um, whether they owned a plate or a teapot or an entire set of dishes, um, or if they purchased cloth and more. So by boycotting goods, everyday objects became politicized, right? T, uh, historian T.H. Breen in the Marketplace of Revolution, which was mentioned earlier in another presentation, summarizes that Americans managed to politicize common consumer goods and by doing so, suddenly invested manufactured items with radically new symbolic meaning. So consumer products in the US were made political. Um, you can listen to the DAR audio tour on tea time and understand the meaning of serving tea in a coffee pot. Um, so British made goods in the colonies became inherently political. Uh, later, we'll look at objects and see that British manufacturers adapted their wares to this politicization. So there is, this is the data we'll be looking at um, within a larger Census Bureau report. Um, here you can see they have it by colony with imports and exports. Um, this is just one page of that report, but don't worry, we're just gonna be focusing on the totals for only a certain number of years. If you're not a math person, there's an economic historian, Douglas Irwin, who has created a lovely graph that's more understandable or and user-friendly. Um, so here is the said graph of American imports and exports. Uh, so imported goods from Britain uh, fell as much as 14% in 1765 with the sugar and stamp acts and the boy subsequent boycotts. Um, Britain was in an economic downturn, um, and this created a perfect storm in which merchants flooded Parliament with petitions describing their loss of money and employment due to the fall off of American orders. Uh, in response, the Sugar and Stamp Act were repealed in 1766, giving the colonists the impression that boycotts were a successful tool for politics. Uh, but Parliament qu quickly released the Declaratory Act in 1766 to reassert its power over the colonies and the right to tax internal and external commerce. Um, however, it was not the end of the tax and trade standoff. So the Townshend duties um, triggered further boycotts with British imports in the colonies dropping 38% in 1769. Trade was restored briefly by 1771 um, and it bounced back but the Tea Act of 1773 reignited animosity. Uh, the Tea Act was implemented with the goal of helping the struggling East India Company by granting it a monopoly on tea sales in the colonies. Uh, and although this did not cause a major price increase, American ports began to turn away East India ships uh, out of anger over the policy and the lack of control they had over trade. So in December 1773, the Boston Tea Party uh, occurs, with Britain retaliating with the Intolerable Acts in 1774, which closed the port of Boston until the damages were paid. Uh, by this time, Britain and America were on the brink of war over free agency, over trade and taxes. Uh, the US declared non-importation and non-exportation in May of 1775. So Britain's parliament responded to this policy with the Prohibitory Act, which embargoed and banned all trade with the colonies uh, and uh, said the colonies were no longer under the king's protection. 
So this policy of halting and pro prohibiting all trade uh, in the US was actually a very bad policy, <laughs> imagine. Um, and in 1776, Congress opened all ports to trade except for with Britain, uh, securing the first trade agreement with France in 1778. Um, however, the US could not make up for the loss of British trade, while British manufacturers keenly felt the loss of the American market. Uh, this mutual economic loss is the main reason that at the end of the revolution in 1783, Britain and the US enter a trade agreement even before the Treaty of Paris is signed. So they enter or they make trade legal in May of 1783 with the Treaty of Paris being signed in September of 1783. So despite the resumption of trade, the US economy was still struggling after the revolution uh, and did not have the same commercial position as before while under the British Empire. Uh, even though the US could trade with Britain, uh, no American ships were permitted in the West Indies um, and other goods from the empire were not as accessible as before. In addition, the US was struggling to establish a trade policy under the Articles of Confederation, uh, which prevented the creation of a national trade policy. So instead, each state had a trade policy, which meant that British ships could evade taxes or certain trade restrictions by deferring to other ports. So returning now to our graph for reference, the Articles were quickly dissolved in 1788. With the ratification of the Constitution, Congress could start to develop a national trade policy, and you can see trade picks back up. Uh, the fluctuations in trade uh, pre- and post-revolution are shown in this graph of import, uh, imports of British goods. Um, however, it's important to note that there's almost no um, reliable data during the height of the revolution. So that part of the graph, it's not super accurate because we just don't know. Uh, despite the war and animosity over trade and taxes between Britain and the US, the prospects of the American market were enticing uh, and important for British manufacturers. At the same time, uh, the new nation was trying to create a history and a sense of national identity in a very short span of time. So this created an opportunity in the market for British goods with patriotic themes. Uh, even if the war had just ended, trade had just opened back up and industry was booming in England. Uh, so there was a desire in the buildup of the revolution from English manufacturers to avoid being cut off from the American market. But after there's a desire to remain the favorite and meet the demands and preferences. So in summary, um, so prior to the revolution, the colonists were viewed as wealthy compared to those in England, um, which contributed to emigration and immigration. Um, England and the colonies really depended on each other as trade markets um, prior to the revolution and consumer goods in the colonies became political. Uh, so, and remember trade resumed swiftly after the war with motivations to cater to the American market. So why does this all matter, right? We're here to talk about uh, decorative arts. So why does all of this economic history matter? Um, so the economic history provides context to show the power dynamics between the colonies and England, right? The power dynamics that are taking place while the objects we'll see were being produced. So they provide some additional information and explanation as to why these objects came to be. So, Let's look now um, to the objects, starting with English-made creamware for the American market. Uh, there are many examples of British-made uh, creamware for the American market from the latter half of the 18th century. Uh, the creamware most commonly originates from Liverpool, uh, which was a major port in the north, and from Staffordshire, uh, just southeast of Liverpool. These manufacturers uh, were able to produce large quantities of pottery and use transfer print techniques for quick uh, and efficient decoration. However, uh, there was still hand-painted pottery uh, and the incorporation of hand-painted elements. So regardless of technique, American politics and heroic Revolutionary War figures were popular motifs on export-bound creamware. So let's take a look at some examples the first one, many of us have probably seen. Um, so this is an example from Staffordshire um, from around 1766 to 1770. 
uh, and celebrates American victory in the repeal of the Stamp Act. Um, it's an example of an everyday item made political by design, and later the teapot would be a political object itself with the Tea Act. Uh, so the painted pot says, no Stamp Act, American liberty restored. Uh, the N in American is very small, uh, perhaps forgotten during the initial painting and added later on uh, as a correction. Uh, during the time the pot was made, Americans were heavily boycotting British goods. Uh, potters in England were concerned that they too would become subject and victim to these boycotts. Uh, so the industry saw the benefits of supporting or at least appearing to support and cater to American political happenings. So the potters capitalized on American patriotism in order to remain in business. Uh, so after the revolution, images of George Washington and the hopes for a prosperous and expanding nation became the main subjects on transfer printed creamware. This example at the Winterthur Museum uh, shows a jug, likely, likely from Staffordshire from 1790 to 1795, uh, with the data of the first U.S. Census, which was conducted in 1790. Uh, the chart with the data is surrounded by imagery uh, regarding trade, naval power, and expansion, uh, with the heading on the reverse, prosperity to the United States of America, right? So the reverse of the jug features George Washington standing on a lion, right, representing England or Britain, uh, with the motto, by virtue and valor, we have freed our country, extended our commerce, and laid the foundation of a great empire. Right, so this is a celebration of victory, um, still focuses on the future of the nation, but also celebrates free maritime trade uh, with Washington pointing out to the ship um, while he stands on that defeated lion. So here is an example at the DAR Museum. You may recognize it, it's on view here in the study gallery. So uh, again, we have the celebration of the census um, showing the size and growth of the US, but it also celebrates the successful carrying out and implementation of the Constitution. Uh, so this first census can be found on other jugs paired with a different image, such as this one. Um, so the technology of transfer printed uh, creamware made customization uh, easy and gave a wide range of design options. So the similar jug features the same census data, the same, same surrounding imagery, um, however, the other side is completely different. Um, this meant that the plates for printing were reused um, and that these motifs were likely widely produced. Uh, sometimes a side would be left blank, on a, particularly on a jug, um, for a special order or customization uh, once an American merchant or some other representative or middleman made a request. So with this in mind, already popular prints were chosen to be printed on pottery because they could be sold quickly with recognizable imagery. Um, you can also see uh, the celebration on this jug of commerce and freedom of the seas, uh, directly referring to the colonists' frustration with Britain's policy and their motivation for independence. So in addition to specialized prints on creamware, hand-painted small details could be added as customization. So the ship name and American flag could be painted on to a generic print of a ship. Uh, so these special order ceramics, typically with a family name um, or maybe the name of the ship added, uh, were mainly ordered by captains and workers on merchant ships uh, while in port. So this is a punch bowl, uh, which is part of a larger set of dishes made for Jonathan Aborn from the merchant ship Patterson. So something like this, with a person's name and ship shows a direct relationship between manufacturers in England and the consumers. Um, and in this case, there's actually ship manifests that mention the, uh, that this Jonathan Aborn uh, actually purchased a large set of dishes with this punch bowl. So here are a few other items from that set of dishes. Um, this practice of American merchants being able to purchase custom dishes for special order actually mirrors the practices of the British East India Company men um, who, while in port in China, um, they would, the East India Company sailors would order special made armorial dishes 
um, or dishes with a ship name and crest. So you could get your family um, crest and, uh, on the plate or a set of dishes, or maybe if you were a captain, you would want a set of dishes with the ship name. So British manufacturers now serve the same role for American merchant sailors. So again, this is a really important moment as Americans were now the ones with money and agency and power to request these customized goods. So this set of dishes for a born does feature an oddity. There is a misspelling on one of the jugs. So there could be a lot of different reasons for this mistake, changing a born to a brawn. Uh, one might just be undereducated working class in industrial Britain, or maybe the speed at which items needed to be produced, um, affecting the accuracy. But we can't say for sure. It could just be an honest mistake. So uh, in general, catering to American taste, British manufacturers were actually largely unaware um, of some of the symbols and symbolism they were putting on these items for the American market. Uh, in Success to America, Creamware for the American Market, one of the authors and historians, Patricia Halfpenny, points out that often British manufacturers did not understand the symbolism of images and were usually, uh, which were usually originated in America and then adapted to transfer printing. Um, so with this in mind, there was communication between American consumers and British manufacturers, but no explanation. <laughs> um, so it was just a request and it was filled. Uh, Christina Nelson writing for the Winter Third uh, speculates that potteries likely had special purchasing agents um, or informal advisors familiar with American tastes uh, who selected designs for export. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there were also immigrants in the colonies who likely still had family connections in England. So they could also serve as interlocutors. Um, you also have the possibility of travelers or merchants coming into port for this exchange of information. Um, either way, English engravers and manufacturers were able to attain copies of American magazines and prints to mimic um, for their creamware and textiles, uh, exemplifying some of the social factors involved in the market. Uh, overall, British potters sought to avoid the boycotts in the lead up to the revolution and quickly resumed trade after the revolution. And in doing so, they catered to American tastes, nationalism, and politics. Uh, the US accepted the goods to bolster national identity, patriotism, and celebration of victory in a growing nation, ideals that needed to be established and reinforced quickly after breaking ties with England. So this mutual need facilitates both style and trade. So let's look at textiles for the American market. So copper print engravers in the late 18th century worked in both ceramic and textile markets, usually, um, and often copied great illustrators, again, known prints um, from the, the US. So Benjamin Franklin was a very popular figure, mostly because he had spent time abroad uh, and prints of his likeness could lay claims to being accurate. Um, so DAR has a handful of ceramics and textiles with um, Benjamin Franklin on them. However, images of George Washington and other important early American figures found their way across the ocean and into print, accurate or not. Um, but even before copper print motifs with portraits of the founding fathers made their way to textiles, America played an important role in the English textile market. So from 1772 to 1774, textile exports to the colonies uh, accounted for 40% of English textile exports. So 40% of the textiles leaving England were coming to the colonies. Um, and by 1804, the US had become the largest single market overseas for British textiles. So Americans bought cottons, woolens, silks, linens, and haberdashery. Um, similar to the creamware industry, there were go-betweens and interlocutors um, or commission agents. So sources show that the most of the exports in the US were based on orders sent to English manufacturers for specific items. Um, according to historian Peter Ma, who writes about Yorkshire and Lancashire um, textile industry from 1750 to, seven, er, to 1805, he says that success in the American market in this period thus depended on the English firm's ability to identify and then supply the types, qualities, 
finishes and prices demanded by American importers. So the American market made up such a large portion of the English textile exports that direction over style was firmly in Americans' control, right? They, they wielded a large amount of power in the British textile industry in the late 18th century. So in addition, the nature of the American market, which needed small amounts of very specific goods, required the need for intermediaries to communicate on behalf of the American consumers to the British manufacturers. So the same historian Ma mentions the use of pattern books and emigre, which are, is just a person who's immigrated, um, to take orders. So this was uh, more common in the north of England to be connected with an immigrant in the colonies, um, as many people fled, their, uh, fled strife to try their luck in the U.S. And actually, the first census in 1790 in the U.S. shows that 66% of the 3.9 million U.S. residents were of English origin. So it was very likely to find somebody with a connection back in England. So the first textile we'll look at, um, this is an example of an English-made textile mm -hmm. with a distinctly American motif. Uh, there's imagery of war, of Native Americans, celebration of victory and independence. We've got George Washington, we've got Benjamin Franklin, um, and Washington drives a leopard-drawn chariot um, while Franklin stands with the figure of liberty under the words, where liberty dwells, there is my country. Um, I'm not going to get into all of the imagery, but there's tons of symbolism, references to Greek and Roman mythology. There's a lot to unpack in this little, little piece of textile. Um, so both iconic men's images can be traced to other sources from this textile. So Washington's image on this fabric, which can be found in multiple colors in multiple museums, uh, was adapted from a painting by John Trumbull, which was adapted into a print engraving by Valentine Green in 1781. So by making a print engraving, it was um, more easily circulated. So Franklin's image um, is actually, or at least his head here, was adapted from a 1777 medallion by Giovanni Battista Nini, uh, which was after an original drawing by Thomas Walpole, who had spent time in the colonies, meaning he might have actually seen Benjamin Franklin um, in person. So another example um, textile from around the same time is America presenting at the Altar of Liberty medallions of her illustrious sons. So this example of the print, again, can be found at various museums such as the Metropolitan, the Chicago Institute of Art, and the DAR Museum. Um, so showing again the proliferation of the print. So here we have certain sections enlarged. So we can see we have George Washington again. Um, if you look closely at the altar, you'll see at least six portraits of other Revolutionary War figures. Um, and so this example at the Met is a little bit bolder, so it's a little bit easier to see the details. Um, you can also see a pineapple, which is often seen as a symbol of colonial friendship. Um, and so this uh, America presenting at the Altar of Liberty um, uses imagery from several sources to recreate uh, and honor the Revolutionary War figures. So Washington is based on a print engraving by Valentine Green, uh, who is based his engraving on a painting by John Trumbull, who based his painting on one from Charles Wilson Peel, uh, who painted Washington from life. So the smaller portraits um, of John Adams, John Jay, Baron Steuben, Benjamin Franklin, General Gates, and more uh, were based on drawings from Pierre Eugene du Cemetery. Uh, which were then engraved in Paris by Benoit Louis Prevost. Um, now, you may remember at this time, right? So this is printed in England, but these engravings are in France. You may remember at this time, Britain and France are not really getting along. Um, so these prints, uh, the prints used were actually likely from two known pirated sets that were engraved in London in 1783. Um, and again, Keep in mind, um, most of these copper print engravers worked in both ceramic and textile industries um, and often copied great illustrators and artists. Um, so they also used popular American prints 
and supplemented with pre-made florals and borders uh, that were popular in England. So this pineapple actually might not be a specific reference to colonial America, since pineapples were also a valued fruit in England. So here um, are the chain of images used in the illustrious son's print for Washington. Uh, on the left is the green engraving, and in the middle is the Trumbull painting, both of these um, featuring William Lee in the background, um, who was enslaved by Washington um, and served with him throughout the revolution. And then this is one of Charles Wilson Peale's portraits of Washington. Um, like Rembrandt Peale, Charles Wilson Peale painted many portraits of Washington. Um, so the exact inspiration is not clear, uh, but this portrait is around the same time period. So I include this chain of images to emphasize um, the movement of information, which was likely done with social contact and exchange, whether in port, through the mail, or in a book. Uh, so none of the goods made in England for the American market could have been made without communication between important interlocutors. So in conclusion, right, prior to the revolution, the American colonies had enjoyed luxury goods, even in the back country, uh, while under the British Empire. After the revolution, Americans wanted to regain access to global markets and the British manufactured goods they had enjoyed en masse prior to the war. By the war's end, both Britain and America needed streams of revenue. They needed each other as markets. The gap in the creamware and textile industry created by the absence of trade with America permitted the US some leverage in dictating the style and type of goods being produced. On the other hand, such catering was also done to capitalize on the need for national identity in the newly formed nation. Aspects of the creamware and textile markets during wartime forced adaptation, forced British manufacturing to mix with American tastes. However, a portion of this mixing was born out of natural growth of commerce and communication between immigrants and the new world, or to the new world, who had friends and family back in England. So the catering of American tastes during the American Revolution and immediately after was strongly rooted in pre-war codependent trade relations and the work of individual interlocutors uh, who served as a communication link between colonists and the British enemies. All right, any questions? And I noticed that this time in Brits and America post-American Revolution, but I also post-American Revolution, there was a great outreach with the Empress China, brought us straight to trade with China rather than by the business, et cetera. So can you comment on this? Yeah, so the question wanted me to comment on trade with China following the revolution um, instead of going through the East India Company. So I don't know that much about it, but I think um, at this point, the East India Company is not doing so great. Um, so, and there's other empires that are trading with China. It's just a matter of figuring out how to get those goods. Um, there is some trade coming from uh, New Spain or what is today Mexico and South America. So you have the Galean trade, which is going from the Philippines um, to New Spain and then to Spain. So you have this point where there, there are opportunities for those goods before they go to Spain. Um, right, originating from, from China or Asian made goods, stopping off into the US or the American colonies before um, going back to Europe. So I, ca I can't comment specifically because I don't know, um, but I'm sure there was opportunities. I think the US wanted to trade, um, but again, the British goods were what they were used to um, and also probably cheaper. Thank you. Thank you.